Hello everybody and welcome to Unlearning Economics. Uh, I'm very happy to have with me Kate Raworth, the author of the best-selling uh, book Donut Economics. And uh, I can see a donut in the background there actually. Um, what there? Uh, no, to oh, your Oh, that right, one there. The, the, oh, yeah, the yeah. Picture, that's the a, big picture. So if you're wondering what earlier. the donut looks like, yeah, uh, <laughs> is that. So, um, yeah, we're probably going to talk a lot about that and about ecological economics and, and stuff uh, today. So, Kate, thank you so much for coming. Pleasure. Um, so, honestly, it, it it's amazing because I feel like the donut model um, is one of the most influential non-mainstream economic models out there uh could you maybe just like talk to us about how you how you came to the idea certainly can um oh i could i could talk for an hour about <laughs> that but i'm so okay i'm gonna i'm gonna show two things that, that brought me to the idea okay so i want to share my screen straight away because one of the big concepts oh can you let me share my screen oh, i have to uh... So how did I come to the idea? I've always loved drawing. I've always, uh, I just found myself drawing concepts and people say, oh, you're doodling again, you're doodling again. Um, but doodling is a very powerful thing to do. It's visual framing and pictures powerfully influence the way we see the world. Yeah. So this picture from Herman Daly, and I'm bringing it because Herman Daly died last Friday and he's very much in my mind and he should be in the world's mind. He was a founding father of ecological economics. And decades ago, he drew this diagram. And I think it's very, very powerful. It's, to me, it's the most radical single circle in the whole of economics, right? So Daly says, look, in empty world, maybe it was uh, OK to consider that the economy was relatively small to the ecosystem. Uh, and therefore, we could theorize economics. We could start with supply and demand. We could have a circular flow of, of income and goods that sort of ignored the planet because there was so much, there's so much air and sea and resources, so many sources to draw from, so many sinks to dispose our waste in. It was unconstraining. But we do not live in empty world. We live in full world. We now live in a time where the economy is literally banging up against the sides of the living world. And therefore it makes no sense to ignore it. We have to always recognize that the economy is, in, is a subsystem. It's a constrained subsystem, a closed system of the living world, which, um, or it's an open system of the living world. Sorry, it's an open system because it's drawing in matter and energy and it's putting out waste matter and waste energy. So it's an open system within the living world. Crucial first move of ecological economics. And if, if there's one thing that distinguishes ecological and environmental economics, it's this circle. It is embedded, it is a subsystem, and therefore it's constrained and must belong within the living world. Now, Herman Daly drew that decades ago, and I remember coming across that and bang, so struck conceptually by the impact that this has. But at the time, there was no way of quantifying it. So it was a very powerful idea, but it wasn't really uh, quantified. Now, I'm going to jump forward. I, I, in 2007 and 8, I went on maternity leave from my job at Oxfam, took a year out. I had twins. I was immersed in the unpaid caring economy. I really came to understand that firsthand. And then when I came back, I said to colleagues, you know, so what's happened? And somebody showed me a PowerPoint and there was a diagram in it that looked exactly like this. And I didn't even know quite what I was looking at. I had this adrenaline rush that that I was seeing the beginning of 21st century economics because this is the nine planetary boundaries diagram published in 2009 created by earth system scientists who say this green space here this is the safe operating space for humanity the limits of pressure that we can put on earth's life supporting systems and the red shows us where we actually are and we are way overshooting our pressure on the planet on climate excessive carbon emissions causing climate breakdown excessive loss of species causing unraveling of the web of life, excessive fertilizer use. And this, of course, is Herman Daly's economy, which should belong within here. And it's not just touching gently up against the edges of the circle. It's massively overshooting that circle. So when I saw this diagram, I thought this is a breakthrough because these Earth system scientists have quantified Daly's full world economy and they've quantified it not in monetary terms which is so comfortable for the economist everything suddenly put in money and then everything never comes out of money money becomes the currency of concern no this is expressed in 
parts per million of carbon dioxide. It's expressed in tons of fertilizer used. It's expressed in the thinning of the ozone layer. So it enforces economists to engage with other metrics. So when I saw that, and, and the, that, that thing is a green circle, right? I thought, okay, that's the outer limit of pressure that humanity can put on the living world. And, the, and these Earth system scientists were saying that the center of the circle, they, they said this is when humanity is putting no pressure on the living world. And it gives us the impression that we want to move back to that center. And I thought, but hang on, I was sitting in my open plan office at Oxfam at the time. There was colleagues of mine fundraising because there was a food crisis in, in the Sahel there were people campaigning for rights of all children for health and basic education. And I thought, hang on, if we move right back where humanity's putting no pressure on the planet, if overnight we said no fertilizer use, no use of fossil fuels, no converting land, no withdrawing water from rivers and lakes, that's not a safe space for humanity. That is death and destitution for billions of people. So I drew a circle inside their circle and it came out somewhere here. Here it is. Yeah came out looking like a donut so that we've got on the outside the planetary boundaries don't overshoot planetary boundaries but also make sure people aren't left in the hole falling short on the essentials of life so that's where it came from inspired by Herman Daly's work made possible by the quantification of earth system science and then I then turned to the sustainable development goals to fill this in let me crowdsource this from the world's governments so they can't say it was my idea or Oxfam's idea or Amartya Sen's idea. No, no, no. This comes from the Sustainable Development Goals. All the world's governments have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim to meet these essentials. So this is agreed. And then let's get the best international data there is on how far people are falling short on this. And we end up with a fully quantified donut, which shows us a, a snapshot of the state of humanity and the rest of the living world massively out of balance. So that's where the donut came from. And it was published in February 2012. So over 10 years ago. And, I, and I'll say that I, you know, I when I first drew it, when I, I sketched it like this, these two circles, I thought, well, you know, I find that very satisfying. I like that. But I literally put it in the bottom drawer of my desk for about six months because it didn't occur to me that other people would say, oh, that that's a thing. But every time I found myself in conversations with people about the interaction of ecological integrity and human rights I think oh I've, I've got this picture and people say that that's useful let's do that so we put it out as a discussion paper at Oxfam and as soon as it was launched it boom it just went viral this concept and it was in the run-up to uh, Rio plus 20 so this is in 2012 and people were desperate for a picture that brought together the ecological and the social right you're not just are you for an ecological protection or are you for social justice I'm here for both and they're interdependent. We can't do one without the other. So it taught me also the power of pictures. I could see how many people were massively empowered by having this picture at hand, by having this to point to an alternative vision that just doesn't say growth, growth, growth. No, I stand for this. And now I can talk about my agenda. And that led me to my path towards rethinking economics and unlearning it and relearning it through the power of pictures, because that experience taught me that if that picture is really powerful, well, what were the pictures in my economics textbook that massively influenced me without even realizing it? When I went back and found them, I realized we could tell and untell and retell the economic story through a few iconic diagrams that change everything. You did ask, so you got yes, a long answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was a great answer. It was a great answer. I mean, there's a really interesting section at the beginning of your book, um, which is called Donut Economics, by the way, for everybody. Uh, about about the power of pictures and actually mm. how um, implicitly you're almost arguing that maybe we underestimate them you know, uh, because because uh, you know it's quite a simple diagram isn't it in many ways the donut right you, uh, yeah. you know, there's nothing too complex about it it's not a really fancy mathematical um, you know 3d diagram or anything but it seems to just communicate the point really really well and maybe that's one of the reasons uh, it, it's taken off so much so pictures are really powerful. And I only, as I said, you know, I only discovered this after that one picture went boom. And I thought, wow, what's going on here? So one, over the half of the nerve fibers in our brains are related to our eyesight. And so we are born visual pattern spotters. And that's why we see, you know, poodles in the clouds and ghosts in the shadows. And we, we're constantly looking for visual interpretation. 
And research has shown that when people are shown text and an image that don't quite match up, afterwards we believe and repeat what the image showed us. So it's it's more powerful. And then also if you think about the entire kind of university education is based on interrogating words. We analyze text, we contest words. And we don't have anything like that kind of critical awareness and, and, and analytical conversation around images. It's And if you look in any economics textbooks, the way the images are presented, and it's got so mathematized, it's sort of words, but really equations. And then the images are almost like, well, these are mere illustrations on the side for those who, who, who need a picture. Well, no, that's just completely misunderstanding how the mind works. The image goes most powerful. And it's actually, you know, I can ask any student, what's the first picture you remember learning in economics? It's supply and demand. It goes in deep. And we remember the pictures long, long after we've lost, uh, forgotten the equations or even what they're called. So we need to work at the level of images. And Paul Samuelson, who wrote, of course, the founding text of economics called just economics, there's a presumption that there's just one and this is it. If you look at his book over time, first published in 1947, just like had 13, 14 editions, every single edition is more and more and more and more diagrams. He got more visual in his explanations because he knew the power of pictures. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I, I was wondering, so you, you showed us a, a kind of filled in version of the donut, didn't you? With like the, the ones mm. where the bits were overshooting and the bits were mm -hmm. undershooting. Now, mm -hmm. this is a massive question, but could you maybe just talk us a little bit through, you know, well, what I just said, the bits were overshooting and the bits were, were undershooting. Um, and, you know, what what that that filled in donuts signals that we need to focus on most and we need to do. OK, so. This is a snapshot. It was done in 2017 and it needs to be updated. And we're in the process of doing that. We're, we're in the, my colleague Andrew Fanning and I are currently making Donut 3.0. But let me just say a little bit about what we've got here. So these red wedges in the inside are about social shortfall. This is a global picture. So, for example, this little red wedge here on food, this goes 11 percent of the way to the center of the circle, because in 2017, 11 percent of people worldwide did not have enough food to eat every day. So we see 11 percent social shortfall. Now, that's, of course, just one way of measuring the food shortfall. You want to look at undernourishment, malnourishment, all sorts of things. But simplifying here to try and get a snapshot that we can see at once. Some have two metrics, um, for example, energy. It's number of people who have don't have access to electricity and the number of people who are using who don't have access to clean cooking. So using smoky fires. So we have one or two huge social shortfall and we want to eliminate all of the red from that picture. And let me say, obviously, that many of the people who, who are made visible here live in the world's lowest income countries. But also we can step out into the high streets. Here I am sitting in Oxford. Right. Oh, Oxford, the elite city of Oxford. Right. I can step out into my high street and find people sleeping in doorways and destitution of people, people going to food banks. So, of course, we have deprivation in the midst of plenty. So it, it's it's worldwide that this is happening. And on the ecological overshoot, these are the nine planetary boundaries. At the time when this was published, so this is a version from 2017. So we've got climate overshoot. So for here, for example, the ecological ceiling is 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And if you, if you know Bill McKibben's 350.org, it's that same 350. That's a, a, a saying that's the maximum concentration of carbon dioxide we can bear in the atmosphere if we have to stay with a good chance below 1.5 degrees but we know that we are way over that over 415 parts per million so this is that overshoot of concentration here we've got excessive fertilizer use too much nitrogen and phosphorus applied to the fields doesn't get taken up by the plants it runs off into lakes and rivers and eutrophies them it kills off and sucks up all the oxygen and kills up of aquatic life and here we've got massive biodiversity overshoot massive excessive uh, loss of species but also the integrity of the web of life the breakdown of ecosystem integrity and land use change now what's happened in the years since then that this was published is the earth system scientists have done more and more research and it's not good news we are going further over and they've quantified some ones that they hadn't quantified before chemical pollution way over on plastics alone and the number and complexity and unknown nature of plastics, massive overshoot, ocean acidification um, on 
air pollution on fresh water withdrawal. So this is getting filled in and the story is extreme. So to me, this is this is the portrait of humanity and our rest of nature and the living world in these early days of the 21st century. And to me, this should be the, the picture that we see. And once we've seen it, we can't unsee it. And once we get that challenge, you know, the, the question that our children and grandchildren have to ask us is what did you do once that you knew? If you were a CEO, how did you transform business? If you were a politician, how did you make this central to your vision of the future, for your, for your community, for your country? If you're an economics professor, how did you teach differently? Please don't tell me you showed up on day one and said, welcome to supply and demand. We are in Herman Daly's overfull world. We are in overshoot breakdown world. This has to be a starting point of economics. And it's not, it's still not. And I, I, I'm feeling this really strongly at the moment, I think because Herman Daly so recently died and I'm so aware of his lifetime of work and it's so obvious to people once they hear it and yet still open the textbooks and it's not there and I've just been teaching to some students in Oxford University who say you know this is not the economics we're being taught why why are we still in 2022 new graduates are coming and new undergraduates are coming to university and still the environment the environment shows up as some kind of externality that you can comes up one day and then we move on and you can do it as an optional paper if you like. This is the living world on which the whole of human life depends. So you can probably hear it in my voice, right? I'm just in this moment of, the, the, uh, this is unbearable now. I, I, I'm, I'm at a, I'm a, a feeling in a radical revolutionary moment of what do we now do? I'm, I'm no longer willing to wait for the academy to, to choose when to rewrite this. It calls for more direct action and I, I'm so um, inspired by the students of the rethinking economics movement internationally who have called for transformation from within the universities and this has to be part of that transformation we take forward now. Now I know you asked me also what do we do? I think we need to transform two major dynamics right this is a, a world this tells us this world is deeply degenerative we are running down the life support systems of our planetary home that's this overshoot and it's deeply divisive I mean, this, this is huge shortfall in a world where we know that the richest 1% of people own half the world's wealth. I have to say that again, because it's so extraordinary. The richest 1% of people in the world own half, 50% more of the world's wealth. We have zero chance of living in the donut in, in those conditions, because you're just going to leave billions of people falling short without the money to buy food and housing and energy, while others massively overconsume and push us over these boundaries. So two massive dynamics to transform. I will do this very quickly, but I will do it with hose pipe. We have to go from linear degenerative, take, make, use, lose, the linear economy that just throws things away, turn it into a circular, a cyclical regenerative economy where we use resources again and again and again. And of course, it's not a, uh, it's not a perpetual motion machine. Things can't be endlessly used again and again. So as Herman Daly would say, Draw from Earth's sources no faster than Earth can regenerate them. Don't cut trees faster than trees can at least grow. Put our waste into Earth's sinks no faster than Earth can assimilate them. Massively reduce our carbon emissions, for example, and our, and our, our putting out waste into oceans because they can't assimilate. But nature is generous. She does get, have sources. She does have sinks, and we must learn to live within them. So that, from degenerative to regenerative and divisive, a world which is driving value and opportunity into the hands of a 1%. And the COVID pandemic has supercharged that with the extraordinary billionaires and now the, the energy crisis, extraordinary profits of fossil fuel companies, this rising 1%. This has to transform to a distributive economy that shares value and opportunity far more equitably with everybody. And that's about redesigning the ownership of business, the ownership of land, the commitment to public services, the ownership of ideas. So degenerative to regenerative, divisive to distributive, that's how. Easy to say. Lifetime's you, work to, to make it happen. The use of... Uh, I wasn't expecting that thing to explode, by the way. <laughs> the oh, colorful. it's, oh, it's yeah. the, good. The, the use of visual cues is definitely uh, un, 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 unparalleled. I, I feel bad for anyone who's just got this on in the background and like uh, is, is sort of thinking, um, 
no, what, what <laughs> what's going doing? on yeah exactly <laughs> uh but yeah you should be watching fully for all the all the visual cues um so so let's talk a little bit about a really central debate um surrounding what we do which is about gdp growth now mm. you and i both share um the that we're not strictly speaking what are called degrowthers we're not necessarily calling for negative gdp growth now you call yourself growth agnostic which i think is a very good term in the book right um so so why is that where, where, how do you see this debate between green, gro green growth and degrowth okay so first of all i'm going to pick up on the word degrowth and i'm going to say i don't use that word because i think it's extremely confusing and I don't think it's helping us. I know I know many people who I massively admire and whose work I extremely aligned with, who who absolutely use it every day. But I'm finding, and I and I think it's happened right now, that people quite understandably have many interpretations of what it might mean. For example, you just said degrowth, you don't necessarily subscribe to degrowth and have to have negative GDP. If I ask a leading thinker of degrowth, such as Jason Hickel, what does degrowth mean? Here's the definition he'll give a reduction in the consumption or the production of and use of resources in a country so that it comes back within planetary boundaries and doing that in a planned and just way. Now, that doesn't mention at all what happens to GDP. What really matters. I mean, I would think what matters is captured here already. I don't need that word. We need to come back within planetary boundaries and meet the needs of all people. So do it in a planned and just way. So it's not through recession or collapse, it's through a planned coming back within planetary boundaries and meeting people's needs. So I, yeah, I, I just, I, I find the word, every conversation I've, I've been in degrowth confuses people and loses people or puts people off before they've even come to understand it. So I'm not finding it useful. I know others do, I'm going to put it aside. So. I believe that we have economies that are addicted to endless GDP growth right now, no matter how rich they are, right? I think we're both sitting in the UK. This is one of the world's richest countries in the history of humanity. It's also an incredibly unequal one compared to its peers. And our politicians and economists will tell us that the solutions to our country's problems lie in yet more growth. And that's endless. There, there's never a point which they say, well, once, of course, we have this and this, then we won't need to grow anymore. That, that's just not even part of the story. And I never sat in any lectures at university, never had any conversations about the question of is endless growth always possible? Is it always desirable or is it always feasible? Is it necessary? We didn't talk about that. It's just deeply assumed. And that in itself makes it part of the addiction. So we have institutions that lock us in through the, the financial system that pursues the maximum rate of return and therefore puts pressure on companies to show growing profits, growing margins, growing market share every quarter. So they're pushed into endless growth. They're not allowed to mature. Uh, it has through banking, which creates money as debt bearing interest. So there's growth locked into that. We have political lock into growth. No politician wants to lose their place in the G20 family photo. We now know that the way that our economies are structured because companies seek productivity gains, if a company, if the economy is not growing, but the company is gaining productivity, it will lay workers off. And so we have a lock in there because of course, a non-growing economy currently creates a massive job queue. And that of course terrifies politicians. So they'll pursue growth. They want an increase in tax revenue without raising tax rate. Growth promises to deliver on that. So that's why we get both Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer in the UK saying the solution to the UK's problems is growth, growth, growth. It's extraordinary, actually, that we've found ourselves back at this moment. So and we're also socially locked in. We've had a, a century of consumerist propaganda created by Edward Bernays, the nephew of Sigmund Freud. He took his uncle's psychotherapy. He turned it into retail therapy and told us that we would find belonging and love and admiration by buying that car or that jacket or that laptop and has cathected objects to our sense of being and, and that we, are, we transform ourselves every time we buy something more. So there's a lot of growth addiction to be undone. And I want to say that I do not know the answers of how we take the growth dependency out of our economy. It's really, it is the, to me, the existential economic question of this century. We have economies that need to grow whether or not they make us thrive. 
And what we need are economies that enable us to thrive, whether or not they grow. I can say that it's quick to twist the words around. It's a lifetime of work to figuring out how to do it. So not claiming, I don't think anyone claims they know how to do that. But these are the questions that students should be directed towards asking, right? I mean, we're never going to answer the questions if we don't even ask them. And so few students are, are taken in this direction. It's still seen as radical. And yet what's interesting is that policymakers, for example, in the European Commission, are already organizing, the policymakers themselves are organizing beyond growth conferences, post growth conferences. Businesses are looking at post growth cities and post growth business designs. The real world economy is finding that growth is turning out to be very low. So let's find a way of no longer being utterly dependent upon it. But economic theory is just not there. It's still hung up, I, I believe, on the idea of yes, we can have green growth. And I don't think there's any decent evidence to show that countries can be green enough, reduce their emissions and their footprints sufficiently and fast enough on the scale that's needed at the same time as pursuing the kind of growth rates they think are normal. So I, yeah, I say I'm agnostic about growth and it doesn't mean sometimes people like to dismiss that. Oh, you know, let's just not measure it or I don't care. <laughs> no, we need economies that can thrive without being dependent upon growth. And, and to me, that's a, a genuine and it's a strong meaning of agnosticism. I, I haven't yet found a better language of, of, of expressing it, maybe independence of growth mm. or, or free from growth dependency. Really fascinating research project. Again, for 21st century economists, say, right, I'm going to focus on, let me take one of these growth dependencies. Now, what kinds of policies could possibly enable us to get away from this dependency? Fascinating question. And of course, a lot of people in the degrowth movement are working on this and really taking this work forward. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a kind of disconnect, I suppose, in the debate because you've got this notion of growth as something akin to like material throughput, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the amount, how resource intensive our economy is, how uh, you know emissions intensive it is, and things like that, which makes sense. But then I think when you translate to the focus on GDP growth in particular which actually isn't the same thing. And you go over this, mm -hmm. you know, several reasons for this in, in the book, and there are, there are many more, you know, like the fact that you alluded to this at the beginning, that, you know, work in the, in the household isn't necessarily mm -hmm. counted in GDP. You know, the mm -hmm. way some things are counted and they're like, they didn't used to be counted like finance, but now they are. And it's like, well, okay, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's still the same activity, but now it, it, how it check, uh, is captured in GDP changes and then you're thinking you know GDP is a bit of a mess of a statistic especially mm -hmm. these days I, I don't want to target it you know I think that's the thing it's like I don't want to I'm not sure that it being negative or positive is necessarily going to map onto lower material throughput even though I do agree with the idea that we need to like wind down the physical intensity of the economy in in some way yes we have to yeah mm. Um, I mean, it's interesting as well. One other thought that occurred to me while you were talking was, you know, the the mainstream obsession with growth. Um, I think in 2018, when William Nordhaus got the um, economics Nobel Prize, it, he he the first thing he said to his students afterwards, and bear in mind this is he's an environmental economist, right? So this is for integrating environmental models into macroeconomic models. The first thing he said to his students the next day was, "Let's get on with the business of creating economic growth." And I just thought. Whether or not you're a degrowther, that seems like a really myopic thing to focus on, especially when you've just been awarded the prize for the environment. Instead of saying, let's focus on fixing the environment, <laughs> you know, that's, he said, let's focus on economic growth. And a lot of economists put, put, put out a lot of analysis of that, of showing ser serious problems in his models. But the idea that to me that an economist who took seriously the fact that human life and human economies and societies and all life depend upon the health of a living planet would then say let's get on with the business of growth uh, to me that's evidence enough that they don't they don't get it because nothing in nature that thrives tries to grow forever and anything that tries to grow forever destroys itself or the system on which it depends and we already know that in our bodies you know if I if I told you my friend went to the doctor and the doctor said she had a growth we immediately go quiet because this is not this is oh so you know we always think growth is good growth is good well that no we know growth is not good and when someone tells us i have a growth we immediately know it's a threat to the health and their existence and we do everything we can to stop it so we profoundly understand the limit of that metaphor in our own bodies so 
take that, take that from bodily health to planetary health. There is no system on this planet that thrives and will succeed by growing endlessly. And, and in the words of Donella Meadows, one of the mothers of systems thinking, you know, if, if a subsystem tries to optimize itself, it is going to be a threat to the health of the whole. And, and yes, of course, there's a difference between material throughput and the monetary value of goods and services sold. Of course, people working on this understand that. I think sometimes think green growth, people think <laughs> that others don't get it. Of course, we get it. <laughs> but there's also a limit to how much you can dematerialize an economy. Yes, there are some economies today that are achieving absolute decoupling of their carbon emissions, even on a consumption basis from GDP. And that is something that everybody should be celebrating. Everybody has to celebrate because, as you just said, we need to de-intensify de the material intensity of our economies. We need to decouple GDP, whether, whether it's growing or not. We massively need to decouple the relationship between GDP and carbon emissions. And it's happening in a number of countries. But that is not proof that green growth is a new paradigm and we've arrived because the rate of decoupling is about one or two percent a year. Now, if you listen not to economists, let's put economists aside for a minute. We need to listen to the earth system scientists. And we listen to nature. The rate at which we need to come back within this planetary boundary, somebody like Kevin Anderson, leading climate scientist, will say this needs about eight to 10 percent cuts in carbon emissions per year, year on year on year on year in the high income countries. So we need eight to 10 percent. And what's been delivered so far is about one to two percent. So it's like telling me that you're running for the bus, but you're just shuffling along and the bus is taking off. You are not, you might be running, but you ain't going to make that bus. And if we're cutting, but far, far, far too slowly, this is not green growth. This is failed. We are not going to decarbonize. We are not going to stabilize the planet's temperature. So a little bit of absolute decoupling of carbon emissions is nothing like proof that we green growth is going to keep us within a stable climate. And I'm still only talking about carbon emissions. When we come to looking not at our carbon emissions, but our material footprints on this planet, that is not decoupling in anything like that way at all. So the material intensity, other than carbon emissions, it, that story has not been achieved. So I think the, I want to get through, I'm talking about the empirical data. And of course the future is yet unwritten. So nobody can claim what will happen. We can all only look at the empirical data today, but I'm utterly not convinced by the empirical data that this means we should have hope and expectation and trust in green growth as a paradigm. And my real concern is that so many people have green growth in their job title, in their department title, in their report headings, in their initiatives, it's it's become like a, a, a paradigm before it's even shown it can exist. And the danger is that we believe in it and we trust in it. Now, what if it turns out that it's actually not possible? What if it turns out we go, yeah, yeah, green growth, we can do this, we can do this. Five, 10 years down the road, oh, we can't do this. Guess which one will be sacrificed? Will it be the green or the growth? It'll be the green. And that means that we will have trusted new technologies will come through, new possibilities will come through. They didn't come through growth will have sustained itself because it does that. It has the power, it has the vested interest to ensure it gets its return, its percentage. It's what will have been sacrificed is the stability of the climate and the web of life. And I'm not willing to take that bet and that risk. And that's, I believe, why many, many people resist green growth as a narrative. It's so appealing. It would be so handy if it turned out to be true because we wouldn't have to very change nearly as much as otherwise we do. But I just don't trust it. And I believe it will destroy us if we slip into its convenience. You know, uh, yeah, you mentioned um, Jason Hickel and uh, hmm. I, I watched some of his debates with people like Max Rosa on, on Twitter, who's a bit of a green growth, uh, I suppose. And I do feel that the green growth people, they're very focused on what you just said, which is like, is decoupling taking place? Are emissions falling relative to GDP in a relative or an absolute sense? And they kind of focus on proving that point. And, you know, there's two things you said. First is first is that that might not be enough, right? We're talking about a physical, physical tipping points, physical boundaries, right, that we need to achieve. Uh, just proving that that, you know, the data show that uh, isn't enough. And also as well, you know, and this is one thing I think the donut guards against quite well. 
people do get very focused on on carbon emissions don't they when they talk about the environment and yeah. there's there's a whole load of other stuff happening yeah. right that you're not looking at that's, that's right. equally wiring ocean acidification deforestation you know yeah. um you you can list lots of other things and you need a much more holistic approach i mean i think and one of the, while we're having a go at economists i mean you you have a chapter each on two of my least favorite pictures uh <laughs> in economics which are the kuznets curve and the environmental kuznets curve which i think mm -hmm. are very linked to this this green yes. growth mindset yes. that we've seen yes. right yes um it's crucial to distinguish between absolute decoupling, which, as I said, is something to celebrate, and a term I added to help clarify this debate, sufficient absolute decoupling. And that's the gap between what I was saying. Well, yeah, absolute decoupling, 1% to 2%. We need 8 to 10%. Mm. So we're not going to get the bus. We're not going to make it. We're not running fast enough. And that makes all the difference in the world. So that one. And But the point you just made, stop obsessively focusing only on carbon and thinking that that is enough of a proxy for the whole of the living planet. In fact, the very reason I've heard from people like Johan Rockström and others who created the planetary boundaries, the very reason they did this, they said, is because everyone's talking about climate. Yes, climate change is essential to tackle, but don't tackle it and solve it at the expense of biodiversity in the living world. So don't, don't tackle it by saying, oh, we'll just burn biofuels and convert all the Earth's land to make fuels instead, because you'll destroy other web of lives that we depend upon. It's a multi-dimensional interacting system, and we can't just go for the one metric. And if you listen to green growth debates, it almost always is argued empirically in terms of carbon emissions. Well, let's look at material footprints. Let's look at land use and water use. It, that is not bending. And so that Kuznets curve from the early 1990s, which, and I can you know, hose pipe is really handy. I recommend it, right? There you are. There's your Kuznets curve. So what the economist said in the early 1990s is that they, they looked at uh, local pollutants, air and water pollutants across countries. And they looked at what happens as countries get richer over time. They said, oh, look, as countries get richer, first pollution goes up, but then it comes down. And they did in their paper, they, they said the caveats, we're only looking at local pollutants. But once you draw this picture on the page and pictures are powerful, it whispers out a message that growth like a well-trained child will clean up after itself. And I tell you, I'm a parent. It don't happen. And I can tell you, <laughs> growth is not doing this. And once you actually have the global pollutants, because we now have that. Right. They didn't have it in 1992. We have it in 2022. We have global carbon emissions. We have much better tables on material footprints and consumption based measures of what nations impacts are. This is not just bending down on carbon emissions. I would say it's doing like that when it needs to do that. It, that's what I'm talking about. It's doing one to two percent and it needs to do eight to ten percent. So that's no good. And on material footprints, it's still way up here. And these things don't bend down thanks to growth and income increases. It only bends. When children refuse to go to school and march in the streets, when activists rise up, when there's global pressure. Right. It's the people's pressure. It's not the inherent workings of the market that bends this curve down. So we need to let go of and leave behind those Kuznets curves. Poor Simon Kuznets would just be devastated to know. You, do, you remember, do you know what Simon Kuznets wrote about the original Kuznets curve about inequality? Right, Inequality goes up and down. He wrote in his paper about it because he was really surprised by the finding he got. He said, this is based on 5% empirical evidence, 95% speculation, and probably some wishful thinking. And he said it would be terrible if this became an unwarranted dogmatic generalization for Simon Kuznets, because that's exactly what happened. He also said he also was one of the first creators of the national accounts, though, wasn't he? And something similar kind of happened there because he said he made similar qualifications about GDP. Yeah. He too. said it can scarcely oh. be taken as a measure of the welfare of a nation. Yeah. Yeah. Poor Simon uh, and, Kuznets. And that's what happened. Poor Simon <laughs> Kuznets. I think he, he deserves a resurrection. A bit like poor Adam Smith. So misused and abused. Yeah. 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 Um, so so um, I was wondering, so. You know the donut model's be, been around for a while now. Um, Ten years, and and the book's been around for for five years, right? So mm -hmm. for half that time. Mm -hmm. um, what are some persuasive critiques that you've seen of of the donut model? 
Uh, well, I've seen some unpersuasive critiques. I, I was going to ask like... you that next. I mean, you can start with the unpersuasive <laughs> ones if you like. Well, the unpersuasive. <laughs> oh, just you know. Well, this is a bit idealistic, isn't it? And I'm, I'm like, well, okay. So, which bit of this? Should, which bit of this should we just like not do? Should we just not do human rights? Should we just like, you know, <laughs> scrap that? Or should we just not do the integrity of the only known living planet in the universe? It's just like not to be bothered. Which bit of this do you want to contest? Uh, so. That I find unpersuasive. Uh, what's a good critique? Okay, my favorite, and of course I, I've, I've got the best critiques because I've heard them all. So I could give you probably the best critique. Now I think that my favorite one, and, I, and I, let me just step back one moment. When I teach this to students, I teach them. So for example, I teach a class on conceptions of human prosperity and progress. And I go back to the 1980s when I was a student, I, I, I was an undergraduate in 1990. So throughout the 80s, the measure of nations and progress and who was doing well, that was done by the World Bank's World Development Reports. And in that nations were ranked in order of their GDP growth level and growth rate, right? So that's when I began as a student, that was the norm. Then along came the Human Development Index, it's health, education, and income per capita. Then along came sustainable development, and then along came footprinting. And I, I show the donut as, as part of this journey. It's in a journey. And it doesn't mean we're done. And it doesn't mean we're finished. So I invite the students to critique and say, what are you gonna, you know, this is this has been around in the kind of 2010s. Now what are you gonna do for the 2020s? Evolve this further. So one of my favorite critiques of it would be to say, well, this places humanity at the center. You could say it's anthropocentric, human well-being. I mean, I'm I'm gonna still, I'm I'm for social justice. I come from a social justice and social development background. So yeah, I'm all for human rights and, and, and protecting the rights and well-being of every single human being. So I've got some anthropocentricity in me for sure, because I, otherwise I think people's rights get marginalized. But this puts humanity at the center. And then all these planetary boundaries around, if if we lean in and know enough about Earth system stance, you'd, you know, that kind of Sesame Street, you know, which one of these kids is the odd one out. One of these is an odd one out, this one, biodiversity loss. It's about actually the loss of life and all the rest of nature and other living species. And if we looked at all the others, air pollution, ozone layer depletion, climate change, ocean acidification, chemical pollution, fertilizer use, water withdrawals, land conversion, those are biochemical geological systems and cycles. This is the rest of nature and the loss of the rest of nature. So my favorite critique is to say, what if we invited all other living beings and species into the center of this circle with us and let's sit down at a great council of beings and ask ourselves, how do we create a thriving foundation for all life within the cycles of this delicately balanced planet? So that all living beings thrive. And that raises really interesting questions between humanity and the rest of nature. So, for example, movements such as half, half the earth, protecting half of the earth for nature, rewilding. It calls on humanity to say, make space for others and, and respecting animal rights in our relationships with them. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's my favorite critique because it's not a it, it's not just critique, it's constructive, it's it moves forward and it takes us into a new space. Yeah, as a as a, uh, a vegan, um, uh, you're definitely speaking my language. I think that's that's completely fair. Yeah, animal rights could definitely be in the center. And rejig some of the other ones. Um, I mean, do you want do you want to hear my critique? Um, I would love to hear your critique. <laughs> go for it. So so I mean, that's, I don't know how direct of a critique it is, but I suppose hmm. one thing I was concerned about is because. Because you have the planet on the outside and, mm. you know, human rights on the inside, mm. there might be uh, an implication that the two are in tension. So in practice, what that means is, you know, it might promote an austerity view of what humanity needs to do over one where we can actually have like growth that also favors humans or, you know, investment, I should say, that also favors mm -hmm. humans and favors the environment. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Is that fair? <laughs> Oh, well, it's, it's, it's a fair point to say, 
and because uh, visual representation matters, right? And so sure. when we try to create a model, it might show one thing, but it has other consequences. For example, I mean, let me let me pile on while we're doing this. <laughs> uh, somebody else might say, well, one of the problems is that these are these are graphs, these are line graphs, and we've got them in circle. And so when we show fifty percent reduction in the human, it's it's smaller than the environmental because of because this is just a radial coming out. So it just naturally gets bigger. So it makes more visual presence of the living, of, it, of the environment, the planet than humanity. Yeah, it's true. It does. Uh, that's a consequence. So should we redraw it? And, and my favorite critiques are ones that are propositional. So then what therefore should we do? So um, to come back to your comment, which was to say, okay, does it looks like their intention. So I'll, I'll step back in and say, well, heck, at least they're in the same damn picture. <laughs> right. But before this, show me, show me a picture before this where they were even present in the same picture and what this invites us to do. And, I, and people might also say, well, the problem here is everything's segmented, makes it all look separate and they're all connected. I'm like, yeah, of course, it's all connected. But we can't literally draw in all the connections. One, because we don't know them. Earth system scientists are only just beginning to understand the connections between these. But also because there are so many, this would be a bowl of spaghetti. It would not look like a donut anymore. It'd be the spaghetti diagram. Mm. But I invite everybody, you know, I always say to people, if, if on seeing this, you want to pick up a pen and draw the interconnections of how everything has positive or, or, or balancing feedbacks, please do. You've got it. You've understood it. It's all connected and we need to learn to connect it. And then when I was talking about regenerative and distributive design, that's actually what you're saying is, are they intention and do we have to choose between them? And is there a risk it makes us think we have to choose between them? I, I'd flip that round and say, no, this tells us finally we have to do it together because when we had environmental organizations over there and they would be lobbying for environmental policies without visibility of the social implications, then I believe that you can get that or social policies without visibility of the living world. Then you can get social policies that degrade the environment, put them together. Ah, now we all have to be smarter because we have to figure this out at the same time. We have to turn this around at the same time. And therefore we need to come up with policies and and I always say, you know, last century's economic theories and government policies and business models and lifestyles, none of them were designed to solve this. They were actually most of them designed to solve this. They were designed to reduce human poverty and deprivation. And it ends up putting pressure on the planet. And, and, and we suddenly say, oh, look, draw a bigger circle and we see an overshoot. So now we need new theories. We need new policies. We need new designs of business. We need new community lifestyles that actually solve these at the same time and for anyone who thinks well that actually sounds quite compelling how do we create transport that is both clean and regenerative and efficient and socially equitable so actually that's a pretty damn tasty challenge to take on I like the sound of that the challenge of doing both at the same time when I speak to young graduates in business or architecture or urban design Actually, it's that very challenge that they want to take on. And we can design for these things at the same time, but what we will need to redesign in the process are the design of business and what it's for and what it's in service of, rather than taking that as given. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, so I wanted to ask you about Amsterdam. So I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but you know, I said the model has been very influential, uh, you know, critics or, or otherwise, but I think uh, it's it's been directly adopted by Amsterdam, right, by um, by the local the council Amsterdam. there, the city, the mm -hmm. city council. Sorry, I'm revealing my ignorance of Dutch politics no, here, but, you know, whoever's in charge, uh, they, yep. they adopted your donut model directly. So could you talk us through a little bit about what it was like to actually go and, you know, apply it practically and for it to be the, the standard uh, of, a, of a whole very big very well-known city yeah and actually this is exactly what i'm i've been spent the last five years doing so the book came out in 2017 uh i i just went and gave every talk that i was invited to give and what really struck me is that people would come up to me afterwards and say yep yeah, love the ideas and i'm actually doing it i'm a teacher i'm bringing it in the classroom i'm a city councillor I'm taking this into my next town council meeting. I'm a, a community member. I'm taking this into our transition towns meeting. I'm a parent. I'm a social entrepreneur. I'm, you know, people taking it into the business and the world of all their different worlds. And so I co-founded Donut Economics Action Lab. And the name is really intentional. Let's, okay, lots of ideas on the page. Nice. Now, let's see. How can we put them into action? And it's a lab because we 
are learning and we don't know how this is going to work and where it's going to go and where the energy is going to be and who's going to start doing it. So one of the first groups of people who started coming were city policymakers, mayors, town councillors, saying, I want to bring this into my town council. I mean, remember back in, what was it, 2019 uh, in the UK, towns and cities across the country declaring a climate emergency. Okay, we've declared a climate emergency and now what? And, and, and we, when we protest and object to the old and critique, we have to have a proposition to replace it with. So the tools of donor economics very much lend themselves to places. And it was the city of Amsterdam that was the first to approach us and, and the, the Gemente, I, I don't have a lot of Dutch words, but I can say Gemente, which means the city council of Amsterdam. They said, yeah, we want to adopt the donor and put it at the heart of our policy on circularity. So they were, were aiming to become a circular city. The Netherlands has very progressive vision to be 100% circular by 2050 and to be 50% circular by 2030. Now that's transformative, right? 50% of the materials in the city are reused and refurbished and recycled by 2030. So they said, we realized quite quickly that being a circular city isn't just about the flow of materials. It transforms business models, it transforms lifestyles, and it has to be done in a socially just way. So we want to put the donut as an overarching concept that brings this together. And by the way, it brings together our climate strategy and our transport strategy and our social equity strategy. So it acts like an umbrella concept. So they launched it and we, we did a, I have one here, right here. There we are, the Amsterdam City Donut. We did a portrait of the city through the lenses. We, we downscale the donut to a city and we look at it through these different lenses, social and ecological, the local impact and the global implications as well. It's because cities have to seek to thrive, but not in a way that undermines life and opportunity for others. So we created this portrait of the city and they launched it in April 2020, which was the height of the COVID pandemic. It was when Amsterdam had its highest COVID infection rate. And that was really striking to me. The policymakers who launched it said, look, yes, we're in a crisis, but if we, we can't just stop doing all other policymaking. We've got to keep coming out with a vision. And also, as we emerge from this emergency of COVID and we know we'll, things will open up again and we will reinvest, what will we invest in? Which direction will we go? The same old, same old? Will we just rebuild, build back what we had or will we actually transform? So we're going to use this as a vision for the economy we want to become. The really interesting thing, oh, let me, and it's a little bit more on Amsterdam. So they, they started in um, looking at circularity in textiles, in food, in construction. So for example, there's a district in Amsterdam that's the only buildings that can be constructed there must be made of materials that are being reused and recycled and refurbished. Like, how do we do circular construction? Let's have an experimental area and do it. Um, what was exciting to me and is, and is proving to be a really powerful leverage for making change happen is that six weeks after Amsterdam launched this report in April 2020, six weeks later, the City Council of Copenhagen had a vote with a vast majority of the councillors saying, we too want to explore what would it mean for Copenhagen to become a city that aims to live in the donut. And then there's Brussels, capital region, the Secretary of State for Economic Transition in Brussels, a brilliant woman called Barbara Tracht got in touch and said, we want to do this here. So we put her in touch with a foundation in her city because we don't do this. We're not, a, we're not a consultancy. We're not running around. And there's no, 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 no. This belongs to you. The ideas are in the commons. We put them in the 21st century commons. You can use them. You don't have to pay. There's not a fee. There's not a certification. You can use them with integrity. Your obligation is to share back because that's what we do as commoners. So share back your learning. And we know that when cities start to say we're doing this, Amsterdam, then Copenhagen, then Brussels, then Barcelona, then Nanaimo in Canada, then Ipo in Malaysia and Sultana Bay in South Africa and, 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 and. And there's over 40 city or local or district governments around the world that have chosen themselves to start using this as a tool for transforming their place. It's never been a push from us. We've got a kind of a commitment we never we've never tried to get anyone go on go and use this no why there's so many ideas use the ideas that make sense to you so it's taking off and we are then at the same time learning what they can do what they're blocked because of course a city is inside a nation in a region in the world subject to the capital forces of the world subject to national regional regulation so there's only so much they can do and yet the stuff they can do and they start making that change happen and I know at the level, say, within Europe, there's quite a few European cities that are now doing this. And I know that at the European level, European policymakers are watching. Cities are like experimental sites that can then have, you know, punch above their weight and have influence on European wide 
legislation and ambition and vision. So that's how we've begun working with cities and we're still learning with them. And, and how will this go? And we still, how, how will this go? Does it last a political cycle? In Amsterdam, it has, they had elections in March. The politician who actually was the champion bringing this idea in wasn't re-elected, but other politicians have picked this up and are carrying it forward and civil servants in the city are carrying it forward. So it's really interesting seeing an idea, can it endure that political cycle and who carries it and how does it get carried? Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. I didn't realize it was it was so many uh, as well. Um, and I mean, it shows that, you know, you were commenting that people say, oh, it's idealistic. Uh, it shows that, well, maybe it is, but also it's uh, entirely possible. Uh, I want the last thing I want to ask you. So I've just mm. I've, we've just spoken about um, positive developments in government. You've probably <laughs> followed our prime minister, Rishi Sunak, and his dilly dallying about whether he's going to attend COP27. He now says he's going he's going to attend it um, just today. Uh, I mean, what what do you make of him and his priorities? You want to you want to end on a downer? <laughs> no, I'm okay, sorry. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first of all, so first of all, I have the privilege of working with people who say to us, "We want to do this work, and we choose to work." So I happen to be based in the UK; that's where I live. But I'm working with policymakers around the world who are actually in action. So I was speaking to a conference of uh, building developers and construction in Copenhagen this morning with real ambition. So I just realised I'm I'm aware that I'm able to keep working where the energy is. And if I had to only work in the UK, I would be so depressed right now, even though I have to say there's a, there's amazing cities and towns and communities in the UK also using these tools. But what's going on in UK politics is, uh, I think, outrageous. I think we absolutely should have a general election and a politician can stand up and say the mandate was for the party and and not just for 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 Boris Johnson. But, you know, we know from former prime ministers, they say, well, you don't you don't really feel like you feel a bit like, a, you know, don't really have a mandate until you've been voted in. So I think we absolutely I can't believe that. What was it? Not point one seven percent of the population got to choose because that's the Tory voters. It's. Yeah. It's shocking and, and and so you know talking to people in other countries across europe they like they're like what are you doing in england what is happening to you what are you do we are so sliding and i'm not just i'm not talking even in any particular metric just in terms of our vision our integrity our respect in the world i think the the i, I profoundly think brexit was a, a terrible judgment and mistake and a country that has privatized so much of its essential services and assets and industries and not cared about who owned them and that they're owned by investors overseas and then still with some crazy leftover empire we are you know we punch above our weight idea that we could somehow thrive alone in the world and I think it's all coming home and telling us you really overestimate yourself and under realize UK what you have done in privatizing and selling off uh, so many essential public services. So I think the UK is in a very, very declined place. And I I also find it really perturbing that, that politicians, whether from the Conservatives or from the Labour Party at the moment, are speaking so much to economic growth and believing, of course, this country needs a thriving economy, but believing that the message that the electorate of this country, that the people of this country want to hear right now is growth, to me, tells me that politicians have got too, too much caught up and, and lost track of what actually makes life thrive. People want good jobs. They want secure communities. They want their kids to get safely and healthily to a good school and to have a chance in life. And they want health care. And these are things we can invest in directly rather than saying growth, growth, growth. And one day it'll trickle back and show up because that don't work. Kuznets curve didn't show up to be true. So I think it's time for an election. And I believe we we deserve government that much more represents the, the real lives of the majority of people in this country. Yeah, we definitely uh, we definitely need a government that will be committed to the donut economics i think and uh it's al almost unth unthinkable that it would be the tories and it's, it seems unlikely that labor at this stage um would be but uh you know who knows what will happen Hopefully, maybe well and just a, on that can uprising. i just 
<laughs> just jump in and say that what's yeah. been really valuable in the UK, particularly and in the Netherlands, is that over the last couple of years, I've been invited and engaged with parties across the spectrum. So the Green mm -hmm. Party, uh, Liberal Democrats, the Women's Equality Party, Labour. Mm -hmm. I even know that some I haven't directly engaged with the, the Conservative Party, although we were invited to give a presentation to the 10 Downing Street Data Analysis Unit, which we did. Um, but I know that some very senior uh, conservative politicians have read and publicly cited donor economics. And I'm going to say I think it really matters that it that it extends across the spectrum. This isn't a book or a concept that belongs to a particular party. This is about a vision of a thriving future that meets the needs of all. Every single political party should say, yeah, that is part of a vision of the world we want to deliver. Of course, they're going to have different policies and different mandates or st strategies for getting there. And that's the political and economic debate. Mm. But this should make sense to all governments. And I think it, it matters that it holds across the spectrum to have that credibility and have an open public debate and that it draws many different kinds of people to, to a new kind of common sense. Yeah, that's a, that's a very, you've made a, a negative question into a positive there, Kate. So that's a really nice way to finish. And uh, yeah, we've gone over time. So thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you. Great conversation. And I love, yeah. I love your work and uh, see you, see you as a, anonymous ally out there in the world <laughs> so this is this is big teamwork and we're together yes. rewriting economics and transforming economics my kids are 14 years old i'm determined that by the time they are 18 or going to university if they were to choose to study economics that they would actually be taught an economics that is fit for the 21st century yeah and every student in the world deserves that i hope so too um kate Rowe, thanks so much for joining us my Ooh. pleasure Okay, everybody, thank you so much. Um, yeah, the I, I was reading the chat. It was funny because the visual cues, people were like, oh, I wasn't sure at first, but then by the end, I just wanted more and more. Uh, and I felt similar. It's just like the, the, just her bringing out the, you know, another thing and another thing and the colorful exploding bomb I liked especially. Um, so anyway, I will see you all soon. I'll upload this to Unlearning Economics Live, you know, uh, all the rest of it. I'll probably put it on the podcast, although it might lose a bit with without the visual cues. But, you know, she's such a good speaker and guest that I think it's probably worth having it on there. Anyway, there is a value video out tomorrow. I wanted to do this before I released it um, for obvious reasons because I didn't want to distract. And I will see you all soon.